Welcome back to Capital City Sunday. Uh, we are switching topics a little bit, but as you mentioned to me off camera, uh, kind of on the same yeah. same trend here. Mary Woolley from Research America is here. Um, and I know that you've been talking to people around the country trying to raise awareness about the cuts in funding for medical research. It's something that really hits home here in Wisconsin, especially in Madison, where we have a lot of great research facilities. Uh, talk about the challenge that we're facing in this country with these cuts. And does it have a lot to do with the fact that we have so much we have to pay for at the federal government level that they're looking for things and they're saying, why not NIH? Why not the National Institutes of Health? Let's cut that. Right. Well, I think there's a lot of things going on in, in the questions you were just asking, sure. Greg. And uh, this whole issue of making cuts because we have a fixed pie mentality right now that we have to take existing money and spread it around differently um, is not the only way we've done business or thought about the future of our country over the decades. Uh, there's been, in the past, more of a let's invest in our future mentality, which goes to things like research and education and infrastructure, which were mentioned by your previous guests. You know, the problems like a brain drain away from Wisconsin. There's a brain drain from the United States to other nations right now when it comes to opportunities for young people to explore a career in the life sciences or in high tech for that matter, biotech, um, in, a, in a nation that's committed to their success over the long haul. It's not so obvious that's going on in this country right now because we have kind of taken it for granted, our policymakers, our elected officials, that we'll always be the best in the world right. in the sciences. And the truth is we weren't always the best. Um, and now we we're don't, not even close, right? Now we're not close. It's been estimated uh, by Battelle in a study they've done that by the year 2023 and maybe as soon as 2020, that nation will overtake us in terms of investment in R&D of all kinds. And many European countries that used to be the best in the world in the sciences, Germany, the UK, are roaring back now. And uh, Japan, Singapore, India, Many, many nations. And, are, and I assume the answer to this is yes, but are those nations simply putting more of a focus on funding research and things like medical research and other biotech? They are putting emphasis in several areas. So, for example, in funding basic research that you're not going to see a payoff for in the next election cycle or in even maybe 10 years, but which in this country resulted in the creation of the biotech industry. We own that. You know, we really made in America, right. but not necessarily always going to be that way. And what's the next biotech, if you will? Now, other nations are also investing robustly in STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math, in a way that shows when you see comparisons of international uh, test scores. And you can see that some nations um, far exceed us in terms of both numbers of, say, engineering graduates um, compared to the U.S. these days, and also in literal scores on tests at, at the you know, pre-high school, pre-college level. Let's talk about real-life impacts of this, because sure. Wisconsin last year lost $4 million in funding. Um, it's probably slated to lose money again next that's year. That's just from the National Institutes of Health. Right, you right. Know, there's other agencies as well. But uh, what does that mean in terms of, are there, are there concrete examples you can point sure. out, research that's not being done or that's been stalled because of this? Right. Uh, there are many examples. So, for example, there's a, uh, the largest and longest term eye disease study that's been going on at Beaver Dam, north of Madison here, mm -hmm. as I understand. Um, 26 years of collecting data from a po the population there, and now at this point now can be very sophisticated genetic data as well as lifestyle and so forth, to try to halt the kinds of diseases that make us all scared of losing our vision or having it impaired in a way that can't lead our life um, in the way we're accustomed. So this is pretty dramatic that this study is gone now. Wow. It's been cut. And so we lose not just what's happening today in that study, but all those years of accumulated research and where it takes us. There's other vision studies being cut that have been cut. There's compromises to brain-related research, um, to um, Alzheimer's, to um, immunity, our immune system, just lots of things. Sure. Almost everything you can name has taken a hit. How much are you hurt and how much is this hurt by 
you see some of these studies that seem that seem frivolous, mm -hmm. and I don't want to say that they are because I'm not a researcher, I'm not a scientist, I don't know what they're looking for all the time, but you know, they'll point out on different national news shows sometimes, uh, well, they're researching uh, if, if mice can have sex in a, in a library, and I'm, I'm making an example <laughs> there. But, making it up. But right. you do hear things like that, and I think a lot of times it, it leads to reaction from members of right. Congress right. saying, why are we wasting our taxpayer dollars on this, and how much does right. that hurt? Well, it hurts, but I think there's a co things going on at different levels here, and there's different um, uh, f there's fingers to be pointed in several directions, shall we say. One is that the science community doesn't always do a good job of describing their research programs in language that the non-scientists can immediately relate to. That is absolutely true. <laughs> so that's, that's on them, on us in the science community. But it's also a fact that it's sometimes people are looking for sound bites, whether they're your colleagues, not you, of course, in the media, or people in the Congress who are looking for the quick sound bite that looks bad. And I must say, your own, um, some time ago, Senator Proxmire was um, Quite with a the while Golden ago now, but yes, 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 the Golden Goose Award and so forth. Um, there's now a award that's given by the science community that goes to the issue of what sounds like it might be frivolous, but actually has made a huge contribution. There's some famous examples in fruit fly research at the genetic level and, and others as well. But it's, if we're just talking about words here. We're not talking about real, the, really evaluating science. And that takes me to another problem that we see in Congress periodically. And that is attempting uh, people who have no science background. Sure attempting to be the experts and, and in Congress an is predominantly a lack of science. That's right. I mean, there, there's there are really few. no science. It's very few in Congress. That's right. Very few, uh, which, by the way, is quite different in other nations, nations that are ramping up their science enterprise. But that, leaving that aside, um, we feel very strongly that, sci that science should be left to scientists in the sense of judging I, what's the best, what's the most worthwhile. It's called the peer review system. Um, not that the public shouldn't have any input. Of course it should. And that input comes from the Congress, the people they elect to office, and directly, often. Outside of making appearances like this and trying to increase mm -hmm. awareness, how do you change this trend and make sure that we are spending more money on research where it's needed? Right. Well, it's about speaking up about priorities that matter to you. And this is an election year. We have, as we do every election year, we have a voter education initiative. We're not a political group. Um, we don't endorse candidates. But we do try to make it possible for people who aren't spending all their time in Washington, D.C. and you know, have their finger on the pulse of politics in Madison or anywhere else um, to f find out what the candidates for office have to say about issues that matter to them. And they can do that through askyourcandidates.org. It's a way of, of, for people who are thinking about who they might vote for to ask, people running, uh, ask candidates running for office what their positions are. So we try to be the, the intermediary for getting information. And we also have information on researchamerica.org about what's going on, all these things that you take for granted for, that we're doing everything we should be doing to defeat Alzheimer's find the answer and eliminate diabetes, cancer, autism, you name it. We are not doing everything we could be doing. How much, we only got about 30 seconds left. Mm -hmm. Quickly though, um, do you think there's a, a movement in America to question anyone who's smarter than you? Because that's what it seems to me a lot of times. You'll hear scientists say something and automatically it's debunked by people who don't know as much as the people who are saying it in the first place. Um, I think that's, that's kind of in the air, it's kind of fun, and we see it on late night television and a lot of other places. But we also know from public opinion polls that the American public respects science and scientists. They don't necessarily know a scientist or think they don't know one, but they respect science. All right. Thank you so much for being here, Mary. Appreciate it very enlightening. Thank you, Greg. All right. Okay. That's it for this edition of Capital City Sunday. I want to thank Mary as well as Kurt Bauer and Paul Radspinner for joining me today. If you have interview suggestions or questions for the show, you can email me at capcitysunday at wkow.com. It's always a beautiful Sunday in our state capital. We hope it is in your corner of Wisconsin, too.